Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience. You've seen the Dr. Oz clip, correct? What? Okay, so. Um, I tend to avoid him. Fair. So, four or five months ago on the campaign trail, Dr. Oz, New Jersey's favorite son, who is running for Senate, of course, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, released a video that sort of resurfaced this week. Okay. And it was him uh, at a grocery store okay. called um, Wegner's. Yes. Which is interesting because there are two regional grocery stores, Wegmans and Redner's. Ah, there is not a Wegner's. Fascinating. And he says he's at the grocery store picking out. This is not a political show. We should stay no, right up the beginning. No, it is not. And do with that what you must. Um, but he says he was at the grocery store picking up. Uh, vegetables for his wife's crudite, which again, definition-wise, not great. Okay. But here's what he picks up for his crudite. And the whole gist of the video is him looking through and, and pulling stuff off the shelf and saying how expensive it is okay. and relating this to his uh, his challenger and his qualifications, yes. whether or not he is, is worthy to uh, serve in the U.S. Senate. Again, not a political show. That's not what we're talking about. Right. So, But here's what he grabs for his crudite platter. And I'm so glad... You have not seen this. Yes, so he gets um, one broccoli, the smallest. Okay. It's not, not even a head he can get. Okay. Uh, a lot of raw asparagus. Okay. A tub of salsa because his wife really likes salsa. Well, who doesn't? I mean, and also one of those packs of guacamole, like pre-made, where it's like f shipped off. And then he's he's so incensed at the price of all of these things. And then he says, and we haven't even gotten to the tequila yet. Okay. So my takeaways from this. Yes. Um, one, I don't think he's making a vegetable tray correctly. True. And two, I don't think I want to go to his house. No, I definitely don't want to go to his house. But um, we already kind of knew that. Even before, yes. and again, not a political show. No. I also have felt that Dr. Oz was not all he was cracked up to be far earlier than his political aspirations. Um, I also find this interesting because the Oz that I do kind of like, even though mm. I'm not into cooking shows, is his daughter, who is a chef. Interesting. Right? Isn't Daphne a chef? You were asking the wrong fellow. I don't follow politicians so, from New Jersey. Well, I don't follow politicians <laughs> from New Jersey either. <laughs> but not a political I, show. Nor do I follow, like, Charlottes and Doctors. Not a political show. Um, but Daphne Oz is a, you know, like a foodie talk show person. Okay. Clearly knows her food. Right. So I would have imagined, I don't know her relationship with her parents, but one would have thought either she would have, like, I know anything I make, I, my parents see it, that perhaps she would have said, dad, not a great veggie tray. Kind of hurting my reputation now because you'd think you'd at least have had a veggie tray at my house, right? Right, right. The, what lame ass director directed this? Yes. See, where are the cucumbers, dill dip, spinach dip, green pepper? And three, all, pepper, all peppers. Do you put the tequila on the crudite platter? Well, I feel the tequila was the only wise decision he was making. But what tequila did he even buy? He didn't even. He didn't leave the produce section of Wegner's. I will admit the one thing that, in all of the history of Dr. Oz, things I've learned, which aren't many, right. the one time I was like, "This man is correct," and other people have said it, was he was one of the first people celebrity doctors to talk about the health benefits of tequila and the agave and how tequila is actually quite good for you so you should drink it so this i am on board with. right how old were you when you were stating these medical facts me yes about the positive the positive qualities of tequila oh i was probably stating them from the age of 21 but, this is what i'm saying yes right, exactly but, but you know the, the public acknowledgement from a doctor that people put you know and yes, I did not drink tequila till I was 21. So all of you going, whatever party girl, you were 15. Right. Not you weren't at Senior Frogs at... No, I was no. not. Okay, good. No. Glad we cleared that up. Yes.
This is Why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. Should we just state, sort of say like a, a quick note about today's show? This is yeah. part of something we normally would share with rock and roll grad school, but... Well, no, who, this is, I think it is... Who doesn't we, love David Bowie? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think more, yeah, just like this is, you know, as m most of you are aware, we, our sister show, Rock and Roll Grad School, um, quite often on both shows, we'll, we'll have an interview that could really be on either show and that fits both shows, which as most of you will notice, we often decide to share those on both shows, so right. perhaps introduce introducing you to the other one or just if you're not a listener of that one giving you a taste of something you will enjoy and True. today's one of those days we should also note that we are launching our own book club yes we are very very soon and mm -hmm. the introductory episode of said book club i can't believe we actually kind of got with the times of course now we're oh. probably like two years behind that's fine but we did our first unboxing video Yes, we did. And we were unboxing the David Bowie at 75. Yes. The kids don't think this is funny when I do this. When you say David Bowie? Yes, exactly. Oh. The same way. Lots my... of people say David Bowie, too. So. Oh, really? No, I... Yeah. I I mean, I didn't... I, think I, I mean, I also will, will you throw in referring to someone as Antony, and that also doesn't go over great. Oh. So, I, I took the children to Dave and Buster's, which, as you know, is just a an excuse to drop a lot of money on tickets for things that yes. you could buy a lot cheaper elsewhere. I know. And so there's obviously a huge portion of your time. I don't know if, when the last time you went to David and Buster. It's been a while. Okay. So going at least with my children, the vast majority of time in that establishment is spent at the little kiosk where you trade in your tickets for stuff. Of course. And so, of course, they have the higher ticket items to try to upsell you. I got to go drop some more change on it. Yes. Here are the things that I found that I was trying to figure out who exactly this was for. Okay. Um, the kids did consider for a while, and then it was out of their ticket range, a button that just says fake news over and over again when you press it. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Amazing. Gets weirder. Um, for... Uh, 50,000 tickets, uh, AirPods, like Apple ones. But that's okay. something anybody could use. Yes, for sure. It's the $50,000 for the Ring doorbell kit that makes me kind of be like, huh? But, okay, but here's the thing. In their defense. Right. When Dave and Buster's began, and I do feel they're still trying to do this. Okay. It was really marketed to adults, so adults wouldn't be creepy and try to go to Chuck E. Cheese's and drink their beer. It okay. was marketed as like an adult arcade, full bar, happy mm -hmm. hour. So there's probably a lot of. Okay, so this, so then the sixty-five thousand tickets for the Nest thermostat seems completely on brand for you. Yes, because the other thing is now what you're doing is now you've got all the families not putting you in this category mm -hmm. where the parents are like these kids are driving me crazy we need to go out for drinks i don't want to pay for a sitter that cuts into my vodka budget right so let's go to dave and busters and then they can play all the games they want and when they want to reform re-up their card we'll tell them yes but if you get to sixty thousand tickets we're getting the the nest thing because i gave you this money for your card I, again I see where you're going, but then 100,000 tickets for the Roomba seems just like above and beyond. That's like some Cinderella kind of like birds come in and dress you in the morning sort of thing. Congratulations on this book. This is really great. We uh, recorded ourselves opening it and just fondling it if that's the right word yeah just the 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 velvet on the front the whole thing it's just so nicely laid out and knowing your other work this feels like a pamphlet yeah well i i guess i have done a lot of books that's for sure i mean this is my main gig people people think how do you do all that but if it's the if it's the main thing you do it's actually not hard to do this many books i guess it's about 115 at this point but but uh, who's counting 
Yeah, this is absolutely the nicest one, though. You're right. It's it's fondleable with the with the whole with the whole uh, felt thing on it, and the and the screen printing, and the you know the plastic box, and then the it's got the the specialty neon inks for the for the ink on the on the book itself. So it's definitely the nicest book anybody's done for me. It's so beautiful. I I I'm at, up in northern Michigan at my mother's right now, and I brought the book with me just to have it. And I put it in its own little seatbelt in the back so it wouldn't <laughs> fall if I took a turn bad. I, this book is the, it's the centerpiece of my coffee table. I don't let people touch it unless I trust them. I open it all the time. I constantly look at the poster and go, I need to frame this and hang because it fits in my house perfectly but then i go but i want it to stay with I, i'm i just i am having a relationship with your book and then i read it and i reread sections and it's amazing <laughs> yeah it's, it's neat they, they added a couple of like the fold out pages yes. on it, right so oh. they did that with the timeline they did that with that you know illustration of all the all it's the costumes and stuff yeah it's, it's it's pretty neat well and it's beautiful and the information in it is so devourable so it's it's great yeah, and I was wondering, obviously, I feel like any serious music fan can't get through their life without having David Bowie, at the very least, pop in every once in a while and say, hey, if not completely change the way you listen to things. Um, what what was your relationship with his music throughout his career? Well, you know, I, I started out as a angry young metalhead where absolutely everything, you know, when we were kids starting, I would say around, um, so I'm 59 now. So starting around 71, I got started to get fairly awake about music. So eight, nine, 10 years old, definitely by 73, 74, super music fan, but everything had to be heavy, right? So, um, so Bowie actually came in around the, the end of high school for me. So 80, 81, um, I really loved Scary Monsters. And then I actually ended up seeing um, the first concert ever in uh, BC Place Stadium. They built, you know, a big, huge stadium. It was a little bit uh, modeled on the, uh, the Minneapolis Stadium with the inflatable roof on it. But anyways, so the very first concert they had in there was... Um, the tubes opening on outside inside or inside outside, whatever it's called. But I love that record to death. Uh, Peter Gabriel was the second act on security. So he was at the absolute height of his powers. And then it was David Bowie on let's dance at the height of his powers. So that's, a, it was a beautiful, amazing bill. Right. So I got to see that show. Um, so essentially, you know, and I was, I was a drummer and I was in music class and all that stuff. So my, my, my horizons were, were going past, uh, you know, mathematically measuring how many heavy songs are on every record starting in about 1980, 81. And then Bowie was such a cool creative dude and, you know, but still had that kind of, um, uh, you know, creepy, foreboding attitude here or there, because just recently, uh, you know, past is is the Berlin era of, of uh, mm -hmm. history, right? So. And when did you start to think that this would be a good idea at, seven, at what would have been his 75th birthday to sort of look back and pay homage to not only all the characters, but just the entire body of work? And I think this book does a good job of incorporating the the artist in all senses of the word both yeah. graphically and all of that, not yeah. just musically, that was part of his persona. Yeah, so so the neat thing about getting to do this book is there's there's really this and only one other concept which happens to be with the same publisher that would be any vehicle that I could even possibly do a book on David Bowie. So just to back up a little, with this publisher, I'd done, I think it's five of these album by album books where it's, uh, you know, I, I would interview some experts on a band on, and try to get, you know, some celebrities or whatnot. And I got my greatest interview of all time. I got Paul McCartney in the Queen book. That was amazing. amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I've, mo you know, I've, I've done some big interviews, but not that big. I mean, that's the top <laughs> of the food thing. But anyway, so, so for that series, um, I did a book on Queen, ACDC, Pink Floyd. Now those three, I couldn't have done a book on because, um, or, or a regular kind of book that I normally do because I don't have a bunch of interviews with those bands, right? I've got a few right. ACDC, but you know, I did a Maiden one and a Rush one and I've done normal books on them because I've interviewed them like crazy. But Bowie, I've never interviewed. And uh, the cool thing about this concept, number one, um, it's just not an interview book. It's not a book where, you know, it's supposed to be full of interviews, but number two, um, 
uh, this whole concept was the publisher's concept. They, they have this idea and they've done some other ones or in the process of doing some other ones. And I've even done two other ones for them that are finished that I can't say anything about, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but this was their idea. Um, and then, and, and literally the idea is we want you to write um, what would it have worked out to about uh, six to seven, 800 words on 75 David Bowie career highlights. And the entire book comes to, I think it's around 45,000 words. So for me, you know, a regular book is about 80,000 words and a long book is a hundred or 120 or something. But so, so to me, it's, it's number one, it's almost down to about half size of a real book. And it's so fun just even coming up with those highlights. Like I did that part, of course. Uh, so, so it's like the first thing you do is you go, wait, wow, this is kind of cool. I'm going to, I'm going to go work out what these 75 career highlights would be. And you, you've got, you know, 10 debatable ones and do they, do they come in? Do they, you know, do they get dropped or whatever? So, so this whole thing. So I've done two others that are both at fifties. So they're more based on a, on a 1974 start date for a band. Um, but, you know, there are other writers doing a few other ones uh, in this series as well. And I, I don't know if it, any of them are at 75s or if they're all at 50s. But uh, yeah, so so that's the great thing. And then I just have to go away and do the writing and um, and all this beautiful design and sourcing the photos and all that stuff. You know, for this publisher, they, they do all that themselves. And, and Dennis Pernu, my editor over there, is such a great music fan and music scholar himself that he he really knows what he's doing when he does his, his end of the deal. What was the first one of the 75? What was the first one that came to mind that you said this that, that, without a doubt, this one's going in? First one that came to mind. Wow. Um, I would say. You know, I, I, I guess this is, you know, as an answer, it's pretty sensible, but I would say when he was at the height of the power, uh, his powers, let's dance. But um, we also had decided pretty early on between myself and Dennis that we would include every studio album and that we've done that. So I think that added up to, boy, is that 27? 27 strikes me as a, as a, a, Sounds a right. possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did all that. And I think every live album or most of the live albums. And then there's, you know, there's all the interesting, fun TV appearances playing live or some of those crazy interviews he did. Uh, you know, marriage stuff and death stuff sure. along the way. And and there's three or four movies talked about in here mm -hmm. and uh, going on, you know, TV with Bing Crosby and stuff like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, to me, you know, when I, when I write, any of any of my books i mean i i'm kind of known as the guy who's like uh i really care about the album more than anything so in my really conventional biography type books it's like an album per chapter i want to talk about every song i want to mm -hmm. talk about the album cover the production the lyrics uh the performances on them uh the b-sides whatever alternate demos so so i i really that that's my favorite part and that's the part where in here because a lot of this is sort of um, you know, knowledge that a lot of people know, but when you're writing about all the albums, you get to essentially write a record review. So that's where you get to sort of add your own opinion. in. And yeah, being familiar with some of your other work, like definitely you can see, oh, it is not that uh, solely kind of the creative, the artistic recorded work. Mm -hmm. What, um, so this must have felt like a vacation where it's like, I don't have to track down Eno. I don't have to track down Visconti. If I can get them lovely, if now Rogers will pick up the phone, hey, I'll yeah. take his call. But like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, exactly. like, a, you know, the, the, it, it was actually a lot of work getting even just the panels of the interviews of the 10 or 12 people to do all those album by album books. But I'll mm -hmm. tell you, even worse was um, when I had to do, uh, I did a book for Goldmine called 10 Albums That Changed My Life which is a, a column that they have in, in the magazine all the time. And they've had for years. All it is, is, is getting a rock star and, and asking them about 10 great albums that they, they grew up with and made them, you know, become a rock or whatever they love so much. Really, really super easy interview. And I must have, I must have probably asked 400 people 
you know, 700 people, something like that. And it's, it's a, it's hard tracking them down and B to get any answer at all is, is hard quite often, but it's such a fun, easy interview. And you would think people would want to do it, but yeah, that that's, it's true. And that's why my podcast, actually, I have my own like history and five songs podcast. Mm-hmm. So I'm up to 165 episodes. I decided right when I did that, Drag. it's not going to be an interview thing. I'm just going to go on a gab. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so you don't have to schedule anything. Right. Um, so yeah, you're right. Um, it's it. I, I love these kind of monastic books where you just sit down. It's all up to you. You don't have to rely on anybody. You know, for this publisher as well, I did these. Um, I did the Clash, all the albums, all the songs, and Led Zeppelin, all the albums, all the songs. Where I was literally just writing four or five hundred words on every single song, and it's just so fun from a creative end to just sit down and say, okay, it's all it's all right here. You know, a little bit of research but no tracking down anybody for interviews. Well, but writing about hot dog for how that many words, that's a, that's a work. Let's be honest. <laughs> oh yeah. A lot of them are a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's for sure. Uh, but you know, it, it's fun putting on the headphones and you're listening for that tambourine track or hand claps or whatever. So you're just like really like dissecting the whole thing. And that, it was fun doing that. And, and that, that sort of the experience of doing that for Zeppelin and Clash led me forward into like when I'm updating some of my older books, it's like, Hey, I'm going to add, I'm going to do some of that. Cause I've taken old black Sabbath books and Dio and priest books and bro- broken them into two separate books and mm-hmm. greatly expanded them, you know, 80,000 words each kind of thing where the first one was 75 to begin with kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. What in, in going through this, did you find sort of surprised you or was like the, Oh, I like kind of a, was a chance for you to, rediscover an element of his career you know i feel like there's people where it's like oh tin machine i i miss misunderestimated for lack of a better term what he was doing there i i forgot about a lot of these career highlights along the way i mean i in a general sense i was just um quite uh impressed with how much he got up to over the years uh there's another guy like this that that i think is even more impressive that it's I, I'm just blown away all the time by how much he got up with and uh, up to in his life. And that's Alice Cooper. Alice mm-hmm. Cooper has, I mean, just, just action packed, action packed, just sure. day in, day out, year in, year out. Just the guy is always busy doing something. Right. Uh, but Bowie was like that as well. And, and um, I think my favorite thing I learned from this, from doing this book is, um, is when you'd get hints along the way about how, creativity was the most important thing in his life and it and it often caused troubles in relationships um because he was so obsessed with creativity so fearlessly creative and you know i i like the way that um he went into all these different avenues where you know art didn't just mean music to him it, it meant it meant the fashion and the movies and even literally painting being a visual artist uh, mm-hmm. uh, along with it as well and uh you know, the writing, the music, the collaboration, the, uh, yeah, that, that was another kind of cool thing was, was the whole idea of, um, how often he collaborated with people and he was kind of finding them on the ground floor. Like he collaborated with a lot of not famous people (laughs) all along Mm -hmm. as well. Um, and you can just tell it's because he, he just, he's serving the muse, right? It's all about art to him. So artists, he knows, all artists aren't just famous people. Our art can be found kind of anywhere. And and he found that all along the way. So true. That's so interesting. In looking at not only this particular book, but through, throughout all of your, your vast body of work and personal love of music and mus- musicians, you know, you've do- dove so deep. Is there anything consistent that you he- have found repeatedly through all of your subjects? Like, these people were great because of this. Was it the fearlessness? Was it luck? Was it, is there anything that comes through time and time again, or is it truly just different for every artist? Well, it, it's, it's cool that you see, cause I, I, I paint and draw as well. And I watch a lot of art documentaries, right? So, so I'm, I'm almost thinking about this from all the art documentaries yeah. that I've seen, but yeah, sure. um, one of one of the, one of the big things that seems to be a regular thing is just sit down and do the work. Oh, what was that? There was a quote that I heard, uh, what's butt in chair or something. Yeah. B I C. Yeah, that was it. So, so, um, there, there were these illustrators and there was this illustrator club or something. And, and I guess one of their, one of their mottos, I think it was B I C 
butt in chair, right? <laughs> Which is the whole idea of just yeah. sit down and do the work, right? Just go to work, um, go to work and have a schedule and just make sure you put in, you know, writers talk about, oh, I, I had to get 2000 words done today. That was my goal or a thousand words or whatever, or I had to fill five pages or whatever. So it, it's cool that these guys just keep, keep going to work and doing stuff. And right now I'm doing, um, I'm doing the second half of the career of Ronnie James Dio. Uh, his so I did a book called Dream Evil, Dream Evil Dio in the '80s, and now I'm doing Killing the Dragon Dio in the 1990s and 2000s. And um, with him, it was really like that as well, where he would go to work. They would routine and rehearse things like crazy, so they were huge rehearsers. And even one of his guitarists told me once, Doug Aldrich, he he had a really interesting um, um, take on this when he said. Um, uh, I, I was in Dio's band, but then I had to leave because I had to take care of my family and pay the mortgage and all this stuff. Because being in this small band at that point in the 90s, Dio, Ronnie still would want you to basically come to work every day and you'd work all the time. You'd always be rehearsing and writing and stuff. So it it was it almost was like a full time job. But, he, but you know, I guess people weren't getting paid like it was a full time job. So yeah. really putting in the hours is uh, is is a big part of it. Um, and that's why, again, getting back to our documentaries, it's like uh, you hear that you hear the idea of happy accidents all the time. Right. Where where it's like if you're putting in the work and you're painting all the time, um, you know, it, accidents will happen and you'll follow that accident and you'll finish the painting uh, in, in that direction. So as long as you keep doing it, uh, just the random putting in the hours is, is going to end up with work, even if it's from accidents. Yeah. How did Bowie's career, since you've usually focused so much on the, the writing and the recording of the music, how did his writing process change over the years? Was collaboration a lot more? Did that change over time? Well, interesting. I, I, I would think, um, I would think there was just a lot of collaboration always. So that seems to be a constant. I mean, obviously, one of the big things is he really wanted to change things all the time. I mean, he started as like almost like a Kinks kind of guy, like a like just yeah. a singer songwriter, folky, very English and pastoral for a little bit. I guess then he became the glam guy. And then those massive Berlin years with Iggy Pop and Brian Eno and Robert Fripp and all that kind of stuff. And then he went super mainstream. This, you know, I could call it his ZZ Top years in a way, right? <laughs> yeah. ZZ Top and Heart. Heart yeah. that way. Um, you know, that had this massive glossy 80s period. Cheap Trick dabbled in it as well. Sure. Um, Kiss, I suppose, in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, yeah, so uh, so his writing process, I'm not really sure. I mean, he tried various things along the way. He had that cut up technique thing. Remember he mm -hmm. did that? Um, I don't know. Did he did he use Eno's oblique strategies? I can't remember if that's in there or not. But he might have been a guy to look at that. Put enough coke in anybody, I think they'd probably be like, all right, Brian, whatever <laughs> you want. Was a big let's, guy. let's let's just coke do it. <laughs> coke was a big part of the process, right? Yeah. He had the famous yeah. years when what what was it? His his diet was coke and booze and. Uh, Green oh, peppers and milk. Yes. Or something. Yeah. Yep, that's right? exactly what it was. Yeah. It's actually quite sensible, really. If you think right? About, right? No, everything <laughs> in moderation. Protein, no carbs, yeah. no veggies. You know? <laughs> totally. I think that's totally. Yeah. In you fact, know? you did get your carbs. You got the carbs from the booze. So. Yeah. See? <laughs> All works out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite era? And had that yeah. changed looking through the book and going through it again? Yeah. You know, era, I would say. Um, I would say there aren't a lot of actual eras because the eras don't last very long. But the but the favorite era would be the Berlin era, and I love I love that whole you know semi craft worky thing and Brian Eno and definitely Robert Fripp, um, which although Fripp isn't really in, in there a lot, but and I love the fact that you know he's involved with Iggy and you get these two black and white period Iggy Pop albums at the same time, which is kind of neat. Um, but along the way, uh, you know, Scary Monsters probably remains my favorite. I mean, it's got mm. my favorite Robert Fripp thing of all time ever on uh, Teenage Wildlife and here and there. Um, you know, it's literally my probably my favorite album for Robert Fripp, although Exposure is kind of cool. His solo album, that, that, that one was cool. But, um, you know, and I was a big fan, the fondness, uh, at least heart wise, maybe not intellect wise for uh, for Let's Dance. And then later on, uh, you know, I, I, it's it's politically incorrect. 
to be a fan of the hours album, but I'm a fan of the hours <laughs> album. The good one for old folks who don't want music that's hard on the ears. It's sure. very melodic and acoustic and well recorded. And, yes. you know, and I really don't like Earthling. And um, what else don't I like? I mean, I don't like the, I don't like uh, his, uh, his, his, um, afterburner and recycler albums you know uh, ne uh, never let me down and uh what's whatever the other one tonight um but uh but and and i love i love the last album as well so so all along the way and then there were a lot of good stuff on next day and heathen and all that as well mm -hmm. so but you know i i think the uh the oddest shocking and possibly people would say i have bad taste uh, is uh, is I'm not I never liked Ziggy Stardust, never liked that era, never liked that look of the band, never liked much glam. I mean, give me sweet, and that's about as <laughs> much glam yes. as I want. I just want my heavy, well recorded, awesomely played <laughs> glam. The rest of the stuff is all just super embarrassing to me. Although sweet looked really embarrassing in the glam era too, mm. uh, yeah. but so did Bowie. I, I um, you know, I. I, I kind of get in arguments with people about this, but I mean, I, uh, I just think that whole Ziggy Stardust thing was, he looked ridiculous. It, I don't, I don't think it was, a was fashion genius at all. I think, I think his, all his fashion genius came later. I, I think, I, I just think that look is, is kind of creepy and weird and not, not very good. And it doesn't even look that ambitious or difficult either. It just, mm. it just looks kind of dumb. Uh, and I, and I really don't like that album a lot. And I, I'm not even like a big Nick Ronson guy. I'm, I, 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 I tell people, tell me where all this great Nick Ronson guitar stuff is that I'm supposed to love. Well, it's been I great having you, Martin. This is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go. Plus. There we go again. Yeah, so, no. so, yeah, there we go. This happens all the time. In fact, I almost got in a, quite an argument with Ian Asbury from the cult uh, in a hotel room about this once. You know, <laughs> and I never got Nick Ronson. I don't understand. What? What are you talking about? You know, you gotta take that back, you know. But but honestly, anytime I brought that up and I said, tell me where, where tell me exactly where to go for the for this Mick Ronson genius, no one ever has an answer. So but he's uh, so lovable. Mm. Like it's hard not to love him. Well, personality will get you pretty far. Get you a lot of places. I yeah. agree. I know we're talking talent and music, but I don't know. There's like something about Mick Ronson's just being that makes Okay, well that's a whole different thing. I was thinking about that. It is. It's a that. totally and, different and yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I like his why... look. His look looked better than David's. Either, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know he's a sweet guy. And I remember I read his whole autobiography or autobiography. Yeah, autobiography. I think it was. Maybe it was just a biography um, quite a few years ago. I think it came out in the 90s. Um, but uh, but no, that uh, that record. Um, I just find it kind of like average and rock and rollsy, and uh, you know I like the mellow stuff on it, but I I don't like Suffragette City and things like that. Okay, I hate Suffragette City. Yeah, I will it's, it's I will. Heidi, it was great having you on as well. Thank you so much for coming by. <laughs> and the recording's not that great on the album. It's just a boring recording. It's not not a not not enough bass, not enough treble, not enough arrangement. It's pretty raw and simple. It's like there's not much going on. And, and so that, that whole glam period thing is not really my favorite. I love what came before. I love what came after. I even like uh, young Americans a lot. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and Aladdin Sane's kind of creepy and Diamond Dog's like kind of creepy. Sane. And uh, Well, that's the little... interesting thing about Bowie. Like, I feel like he's one of those artists that you can put on at a party or something and no one is going to have a problem. Something's going to come up where they're like, oh, I like this one. Whether it, it is the, the Ziggy Stardust stuff, whether it is the the thin white duke era like there's something that everyone is going to be okay with it, he's yes. one of those artists that just constantly cross the board you can't put on rush and have everyone be like oh i like this one like that yeah. that will clear a room in the best way possible if you ask me right, but that's true. neither here nor there <laughs> but bowie is sort of like one of these people that just across the board everybody agrees with his genius i think even dylan people go well i don't like his voice i don't like this there's these but like bowie is someone who just there's something for everybody which you can't really say about these really you can't always say about really great artists i think the yeah, beatles it's, it's funny with him as well that that you know he, he he tried so many different things and he was uh you know when a trend was happening sure maybe he was a following a trend or something at some point whatever but the point is it's almost like he's given you the entire history of rock and roll he's like he's mm -hmm. like the soundtrack 
to the history yeah, of rock and perfect. roll. And, you know, other bands, you know, Kiss has even kind of done that in, in a minor way. Um, but Todd Rundgren's kind of interesting that way. He's, he's done a little bit of that. But, but yeah, you, when, I think of, when I think of Rush or ACDC or, uh, I don't know, I, I don't think ZZ Top particularly, you know, th there's a lot of bands that have three or four things they do or eras they do, or even, mm -hmm. or even later in life, they go back. Like ZZ Top, for example, I love everything they did in the 90s. But it's actually even more kind of like archival and old timey and grandpa music than even their earlier stuff For in a sure. lot of ways. <laughs> so so it's like they're certainly not doing here's our grunge period and here's our here's our hip hop album, here's our new metal album, you know, and you know so, so there's so, but Bowie, Bowie kind of did all that. Like he he went yeah. and he went and it's like, hey, it, this is what's happening now. I'm part of it. So what's the album of your collection that you dig out more than any other? to listen to just to listen to wow so you know i mean i have my favorite albums of all time but they're such favorites that i played them 500 times but so many times they're all in the past and i never pull yep up play again, i do right? that too <laughs> yes exactly so like here they are but i never played so, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of those but um you know the bands i've played the most lately i think and when i say lately when i say the last 20 years say i play a lot of the damned and xdc nice. and the jam and i actually have played lots and lots of bowie as well um you know clutch is a really weird one i i end up playing oh. clutch all the time yes. last tyrant just gets played constantly um you know Heidi, probably one of the main reasons i would play an album over and over again often has to do with just how gorgeously produced it is right mm -hmm. so you're sure. playing on different stereos all over the place and go wow this makes my stereo sound good mm -hmm. so good right so that happens a lot, but um, yeah. yeah, oddly, oddly, the first one that popped into my head, which probably isn't even correct, is Clutch Blast Tyrant, two thousand four, favorite Clutch album. I love it. That yeah. works. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like you said, you're either, it's either that, it's either like how it sounds and the production and all those things, or sometimes for me, it's just the mood it evokes, and it might be an album that. Like you might not be the greatest album of all time or a favorite, but it just brings uh, the feels, whatever those feels are. You need it takes you. Time. Yeah. I got another really weird one to bring up with you. That's super obscure that I've talked about uh, uh, quite a bit, but uh, and I even tracked down and did a couple interviews on it and I've never used them anywhere, but it's probably, you know, some of the coolest things just to have. Um, there was this, uh, there was this album from Hawaii in 1973, an indie album called these trails. And uh, the band was called These Trails. The album's called These Trails. And it's just a duo between these, these two people, Patrick Crockett and Margaret Morgan in Hawaii. And um, it's one of these $1,000 albums if you got it on vinyl or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't have one. But, um, but it's been reissued a couple times. But it's just one of these super hip, hip person rare things. But what it is, it's, um, first of all, it's got these amazing amazing female vocals like super high like Joni Mitchellist like some of my favorite vocals of all time it's it's in the category of weird folk so w-y-r-d folk I would say it's okay. got some of the early uses of synthesizer and it was like in done in the best studio in Hawaii with this synthesizer guy who was like a Hawaiian legend uh it's uh it's kind of really complex acoustic guitar so it reminds you of like Nick Drake mm -hmm. uh, or everybody's favorite things ever done by Jimmy Page, that kind of thing. Um, and then it's got slack key tuning, which is this Hawaiian tuning stuff mm -hmm. through it as well. And it's also a little bit kind of paranormal in the lyrics and a little spooky. Um, so that record I've often put in my cheeky list of favorite albums of all time. And that is a record I play all the time still. And I've been playing a long, long time since I found it. So I've probably played it about a thousand times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, check it out. These trails. Yeah. It's, it's really, really quiet and acoustic and awesome. and just the, the most interesting kind of weird folk you'll, you'll ever it. hear. That's awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. So yeah. I'm trying to think of a good way to put a bow, no pun intended, on <laughs> our Bowie conversation. And like like the normally you'd say, well, what's that one song where people go listen to this and you'll understand where this artist is coming from, but Bowie is so diverse. I think this book is such a great compendium to put on the records and just sort of 
wind your way through it, where he's one of those people where it's hard to get into initially because there's so many avenues to get into, which maybe that's part of the reason he's so great. But what was your, did your appreciation for his work grow as a result of spending all this time with him? Yeah, certainly. And and again, um, what I love about it is it is the lesson you learn from it maybe is just this idea about, uh, you know, revering creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that about him. So it's so just all along the way, trying all these different arts avenues, you know, live theater and stuff. Any anybody yeah. who does live theater, like thinking of Paul Stanley and Sebastian Bach. I mean, I might my, my my estimation for those guys goes way up when I think, you know, you went and did live theater. Right. And actors always right. say that, too. Right. That's the coolest thing you can do, right? Um, but the fact that he did that's amazing. But uh, yeah, I, I just I just like that whole throughput throughout the whole thing. It's like, and he's just like, you know, the drugs and the sex and all this. It's it's almost like it's it's he's like Aleister Crowley doing sex magic for for a reason, right? You know, for, for creativity or spirituality or or something, right? But but it's almost like everything that he did that was a super extreme. You almost think in the back of a mo his mind, it's like it's like he's doing it um, to to be inspired creatively, to rewire his mind, right? Um, so yeah, so all along the way, like he didn't suffer fools gladly, and he and he and he was very impatient, and he moved along, and he changed the bands all the time, but it it just always seemed like he was just like really with a lot of energy chasing a muse the whole time. Bowie at 75 by Martin Popoff is available September 6th wherever you get your books. For more information or to check out any of Martin's numerous other books, check out his website, martinpopoff.com. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website and don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?